Okay. Afternoon, everybody. Welcome along. Um, we'll get we'll get going because I know there's uh, there's a little bit of an event later on that you you may be keen to get to. So. What we're going to look at for the next 20 minutes, so as uh, the optimization and maintenance of healthy Salesforce orgs and some free tools and um, techniques that you can use to make sure that that's main, yeah, that is maintained and uh, remains resilient and high. So, um, first of all, I don't think there's anything uh, in the course of this presentation that is uh, yet to be released, but obviously a reminder to uh, base any purchasing decisions on that which is already generally available. Uh, and I'd like to start by thanking everybody here for coming along to this session, obviously, to coming along to Dreamforce. It's a, a heck of a commitment, um, however far you've got to travel in terms of time, cost, you know, um, uh, knock-on effects on families, etc. So uh, thanks ever so much for your attendance and your continued support. Um, uh, ongoing. So, um, now, <laughs> on, the, on the app still, and um, maybe on the front, you may be expecting to see Rob Cowell. I'm not Rob Cowell. Um, I apologize for those of you <laughs> who wanted to see Rob. Um, he's unfortunately not been able to make it out here. I work with Rob, as you can probably tell. Um, I've, um, I've got a similar background, so we, we still sort of see the same, the same view of the Salesforce world. So um, hopefully I'll do his thoughts justice over the course of the rest of this session. So let's, let's dive into it. Um, performance analysis. Um, obviously, in, in an environment where we're dealing with governor limits and uh, the, all the challenges of multi-tenant architecture, we want to make sure that the performance of our org clearly is as optimal as possible. So how do we... <laughs> How do we get a reading on where that is? Well, fortunately, we've got uh, some friendly and useful uh, tooling from Salesforce in the setup menu, the optimizer. You get there, literally optimizer in the setup menu. You enable it. Um, you can run it on a schedule. You can run it ad hoc. It'll say that it takes about 24 hours to complete. It, I've never had it take 24 hours to complete. Uh, you'll get an email, though, when it does complete but you can even refresh a page and see the results as they start coming through. And this is going to give you uh, a number of elements of the org that are going to be judged against well-known Salesforce standards uh, in a variety of areas and give you actionable points to understand where your org may be less performant than would be considered ideal and allow you to improve those settings to get that performance back. There are a variety of um, areas. We'll look at three in particular in the course of this, uh, uh, this session. Field usage. I don't know about you, but I've certainly worked in projects where we've been up against the limit for fields on, a, on an object. Requirements come along for more fields. What do we do? Record counts. For anybody who's been, who's dipped a toe into the uh, Salesforce architecture documentation, you'll be very aware of the consequences of high record counts on various aspects of Salesforce performance and the importance of making sure that you've got a manageable amount of data in the org. Custom code. Now, this is obviously an admin-focused session rather than a developer one, um, but we'll see what the org um, optimizer gives us and how you can use that. So here's, here's the optimizer having been run. You can see the console view. Uh, very handy. Open out the tabs as you go into the things. What we're looking at here is the field usage one, as we spoke about previously. You can see here, um, this is telling us that we've... Um, got three fields on the account layout that have been completed less than 10% of the time within the last three months. So this is clearly a, potentially an indicator that these fields are, you know, are they adding value to the business, right? If they're not getting completed, are they taking up space on the object? Are they taking up space on the layout that could be used better? Right? And you can see various categories down the left-hand side that show you that not only are you getting this information of what these things are, you'll get in a, a, a category, so that will help with filtering. Um, you'll get in a, 
an estimate from Salesforce as to how long it's actually going to take you to at least assess um, the area in focus. And then Salesforce's own um, interpretation, let's say, of what you need to do, right? Is, is action required? Do you just need to review it? Is everything, is everything okay? So you're going to get actionable information that you can actually drill into and go and tackle any of these areas. So with that run, what do we do within the org? Well, field cleanup. These should be hopefully quite self-explanatory, right? If, we, if we've got unused fields, maybe we clean them up. Potentially merge them. Maybe normalize the database to create other objects, potentially. Archiving of records in terms of that... Um, record count, um, have it, you, you can break any number given the limits by having excessive records. You know, reports take a long time to run, triggers could fail, etc. You can move records into the, the virtual basement <laughs> for, for storage and archiving. Um, optimizing custom code, like I said, this isn't a developer session, of course, but at least with the optimizer report, you've got canonical evidence from Salesforce that says, we don't want to foster a them and us culture, right? Admins and devs. But you've got a report there from Salesforce saying, it's saying there, there are inefficiencies in the code. If you're familiar with it, these might be things like two, two triggers on the same object, which are potentially things that can cause problems, right? In race conditions, you can't determine the order that they run in. Security. Um, it's tempting to think... Oops, sorry. It's tempting to think... Uh, when you're on Salesforce, that the, the security is sorted, right? That's what, that's what the license fee goes towards. It's true for the hardware, obviously, but all the data in the org right, is still our responsibility to secure. That's what people are after, ultimately. If they can't get into it from the database, they can get into it through the org, through the UI layer, through the API layers. So how do we know that our org is secure from that regard? Well, again, we've got, in this term, the Salesforce health check in the setup menu that you can run against an org to give you the same sort of visibility into areas where things might not be quite as expected against best practices and common standards. Once again, there's a variety of areas. We'll pick out four. Password policies, quite self-explanatory. They, do they meet the standards for complexity and frequency of refresh? Um, session, session settings, similarly. How long do tokens take to expire, for example? Certificate and key management, the certificates being kept up to date, they're likely to expire soon. The sizes of the keys that you might be using to encrypt the uh, Salesforce Shield, if you're using that. And network access, you know, is it, are there any restrictions on IP ranges or login hours? Those sorts of things. So, what does it look like? <laughs> we were just talking beforehand about <laughs> how, what's the worst you've ever seen. Um, this is a, an example, right? This is not reflective of anyone's, um, mine or Rob's attitude towards Salesforce or uh, security. Um, we, we've, we've run it here, right? We've got a number of uh, factors we can see on the left-hand side very easily. That, um, we've got some critical items, a few that are fine, a warning. We're looking here at the high security section, the high risk section, rather. If we were to scroll down, there's a medium, low, and informational. So Salesforce already categorized these things for us. Um, so we, we can be sure which ones are, are really important. And we can take action accordingly, obviously. We've got a helpful link on the right-hand side that will take us to the relevant bit of setup to address the issue in question. But how do we address it? So taking those four items again, we reviewed the security scores. We've seen how easy that is, right? Salesforce will give us a percentage that reflects, according to their own algorithm, how secure we, uh, it thinks we are. The critical areas are easy to identify, obviously. We saw on the left-hand side of the column uh, which are the critical areas. Make adjustments. Obviously, we need to do this um, carefully, <laughs> let's say. Um, yeah, security isn't necessarily the sole domain of the Salesforce admin, obviously. There are maybe corporate security stances around IP login hours. You, know, you don't, you don't want to um, lock people out who are actually trying to actively um, do work at certain times of the day. Uh, there may be um, single sign-on uh, options for password uh, you know, that take the password considerations out of the equation. Um, so there's a number of factors to balance up when determining what the action actually is that you can take. 
but I, probably the most important of all of them is to continuously monitor the score, right? This isn't a one-off thing. The bad guys who want the data don't stand still, so neither does the security posture. New things will be added to the health check, new areas, standards will increase, and so it's critical to continually run this, track that score, and hopefully get this sort of gently tapering upward score towards 100%. But again, that's free and a tool we should all use. So that's the serious side of data, right? the, the breach, etc. Data quality, though, has its own increased importance now. There's, um, there's this thing called AI around, which, uh, which relies on good quality data to get good quality outputs, obviously. Data cloud, you know, all the, even if you're not using this, reporting and analytics that you might be using outside that still rely on good quality data. So how do we make sure that that's what we're getting into the org? Well, we can first identify where things are going wrong using functionality like field history tracking, where I think it's 20 fields per object, isn't it? You can make sure that you um, are, are seeing the changes to those fields in real time. You're not just looking at the record, seeing what the latest value is, even if that was set a couple of years ago. You can see the incremental changes to these fields. You can put validation rules on um, to ensure that any entry to new or changed records matches a certain standard. And what, because they're actually, well, one of the great things is, of course, they work at the database level so that regardless of the method of input, if it's API, if it's UI, whatever it is, that's going to, that's going to trigger. They don't work retrospectively, though. You can put it on an object. Any records there, if their values don't match the, uh, the constraint that you've just added, Salesforce will let the validation rule go on. What you can do, though, is create a custom report, find the records where the existing data doesn't match these standards, because you maybe want to get ahead of that, right? You can create validation rules and make them complex so they only work on new and check the change value, but ultimately, if there's a standard for the value in that field, you probably want to make sure that that field contains values that match that standard. So once we have a vision of how clean the data in our org is, or how clean it maybe isn't, what can we do to address it? Well, deduplication makes a lot of sense. It's very rarely good. I don't think I can think of a circumstance in which it's ever good <laughs> to have duplicate records representing the same thing. Um, so you've got, again, standard Salesforce functionality on key standard fields to recognize and prevent duplication of records, and there'll be any number of third-party tools that can help you with custom objects. Archiving old records, as we've touched on with the, um, with the optimizer, taking excess records or records that don't need to be involved in transactional operations going forward at the current time. You maybe still need them for compliance purposes. You can archive those off, take them out of the database, and then old records that maybe don't meet the constraints of modern operations don't impact upon them. Data enrichment, um, this is fascinating. I don't have time to go more into it, but you know, if you ask 100 people in the UK to write an address down, you'll probably get 20 different formats. You can, uh, data enrichment tools can ensure that you get a, a standard output for any given uh, thing like an address or common, uh, common data formats to mean that you've not got multiple different variants of what's essentially the same bit of data. And storage limits. Um, I don't know if anybody's hit storage limits, but it's not fun. <laughs> you've got a soft limit around 100, obviously. You can go a bit further, but once you hit that complete storage limit, then it really is sort of business standstill, right? Nobody's putting any more data into, into Salesforce at all until you address that. So getting ahead of being near to that limit is obviously critical. Business standstill is not a good situation. The final element we'll look at are the Salesforce releases themselves. Um, in terms of optimization and org maintenance and health, then as the platform evolves, there's, there's very often new functionality that we can use and leverage to take away customizations that mean that we have to test and we've got to um, maintain, right? We should use custom, we should use platform first. So as releases come out, 
make sure that you're reviewing the release notes, getting on top of anything that's likely to impact your implementation, anything that you can take advantage of that's coming up. The release notes are a big, right? <laughs> a big effort. Reviewing the release notes, it's a bullet point there, but that's maybe, that's maybe a little bit challenging. So you can join release readiness groups, join community efforts that get involved in, you know, get different perspectives on the release, right? You might see new features or different views of new features that you hadn't realized may be beneficial to yourself. And sandbox testing, it makes sense, doesn't it? Right? Make sure that there are no surprises when that release gets rolled out into production. To bring it back around to the first two, the optimizer, the health check, their standard functionality, these are standard offerings. So if they've been upgraded as part of a, cell, of, of a platform release, in your sandbox, if that's a high enough fidelity to your production environment, you can run these ahead of production release and get a new view of your optimization of your health score, of your position, pre the release rolling out to your production environment. So definitely keep on top of that. So for releases, test critical customizations, update any documentation that's going to be relevant to the business processes that might change as a result of the new functionality, and plan for post-release maintenance. With the best will in the world, things may not always go to plan. Be ahead of that. If things don't work out as you expect, know what you're going to do in terms of rolling back certain features that you might be trying to adopt as part of the release. So, to round it all out, the four areas, the four areas we looked at, performance, where you've got the Salesforce optimizer, the security audits, the Salesforce health check, two completely free options available in the setup menu, use them regularly, keep on top of those scores, and their output. Data quality, never been more important. All the business decisions that are being taken on the basis of the data that you've got in your org are going to be impacted by that. And release updates. Plan and test them. Don't get caught out by those things that become enforced, having been optional for three years or whatever. Okay. Thank you ever so much for your time, your patience. I've, uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed bringing Rob's thoughts to you. And if you are wanted to give the feedback, of course, always welcome. You win coffee. That could be very useful tomorrow morning. And thank you ever so much.